Welcome back to the Crash Course Podcast. My name is Craig Crash Collins, joined as always by Brandon Scott, otherwise known as B. Scott. we got a lot of predictions to get to uh, in tonight's podcast. We're going to talk about our predictions for what the Pacers should do this offseason as their season is officially over. We we thank our lucky stars for that one. We were talking about that one last week. Uh, we also are going to talk about our NBA playoff predictions um, as that gets underway. And then, of course, it is race week after all. Very excited. We're finally at the Indianapolis 500. Um, it's going to be a fun week. We're very excited, so we'll give our predictions for the race. We'll give our predictions for who's going to win, our rookie of the year, um, who's going to, uh, who's like a dark horse to win. It's all going to be wrapped up in tonight's podcast. We're very excited. B. Scott, first of all, though, how was your week, man? It was busy. To say the least, it's been crazy busy. How about yours? Mine was good. Mine was good. Busy as well. You know, always always working, always uh, doing that stuff on the content creation path as well, both uh, over on this end of things and then, of course, on the uh, Craig Crash uh, gaming channel as well, twitch.tv slash Craig Crash. Cheap plug. There you go. Um, but, uh, you know, B. Scott, you, you're a little darker for a reason, and that is because you are we're our man on the scene uh, for qualifying. I mean, that sounds, I mean, that was a fun time. Must've been nice to get back to the track. It was nice to get back to the track and just be around the, the cars and everything. The sound of the engines, very different with all the mask, uh, guidelines and everything. Um, luckily though, well, one of the big downsides, so I was up in the pagoda up on the eighth floor of the pagoda. Once you're up there, you do not have to wear a mask. So that was nice. However, typically when you're up there, you do get garage and pit passes. Except this year, I did not know this until I got there. You need to have, you need to be fully vaccinated, have your vaccination card with you and your photo ID, and take it down and get stamped to show that you've been vaccinated and everything. And um, yeah, so I was not able to go around the garages or the pits this year, but that's okay. I'm still up getting to watch the cars go fast yeah what were the restrictions just out of curiosity because like i saw a video from our uh, friend matt taylor from like turn one and there were everybody was real packed together so i was like i don't know i'm not really (laughs) i mean i guess i guess out in the stands they probably weren't police areas where they're like mask up you have to wear your mask you have to wear your mask like we went and stood by the garages just watched the cars go by for a little bit and they're like you need to put your mask on over here okay fine but you go there's Prob- I, I would say probably about 90% of people walking around had no masks on. Um, I know in the stands there's stickers showing where do not sit here, but it's so hard anyways, especially when everything's general admission and how are you – the yellow shirts are just like forget it. I'm not policing that. I'm not policing the mask situation unless it's in a high traffic area or people are just standing around in an area. But like – it's, it was 90 degrees. Nobody wanted those things on. I mean, there was even the police officer up at our level of the pagoda was joking about how the mask thing was so stupid with it being so hot. He go, I mean, so I'm interested to see how race day goes. This Sunday I'll be there. Um, I'll have my mask with me, but I'm, like, I'm not going to put it on unless somebody says put it on, and I highly doubt it, yeah. to be honest. I had to put it – you had to put it on to go in the gate – and that was about it. But I'm driving <laughs> into the track on Sunday. So, I mean, I'm not having to go through a ticket gate or anything like that. So, yeah. So, yeah. It, oh, it, the nice thing is it's cool. They, they have these little baggies you can pick up that have a mask in it and a bottle of hand sanitizer. However, it's the hand sanit- that bottle of hand sanitizer looks like an airline or a mini fridge bottle of vodka. So it looks like <laughs> about three bottles of vodka. That's probably that's great. Hey, I mean, you know what? You would need uh, some sort of uh, alcoholic beverage to uh, talk about the Pacers, which is what we're about to uh, talk about here. Uh, you need something to kind of drown the sorrows and uh, make it a little easier to talk about here, because uh, that is our first topic on the podcast tonight. We're going to talk about uh, the Indiana Pacers, of course. You know, we we talked about it last week on the show. We were like, you know, hopefully we didn't want them to make the playoffs, you know, to begin with because we wanted them to have a better draft pick. Uh, they made the play in tournament they win the first game and i even sent out a tweet i was like 
please tell me that Nate Bjorkren isn't going to end up being the coach next year because he, you know, won his way into the first round and then the Pacers, you know, get swept but look good against the Sixers or something like that, um, you know, or against the Nets. Um, you know, they win that first game, one for, uh, 144 to 117. They did shoot uh, 55% from the floor, 45% from beyond the arc. DeMontis Sabonis had 14 points, 21 rebounds, and was one assist off of a triple-double. The man was on fire. O'Shea Brissett had 23 points, 5 rebounds. I mean, just the second great uh, Brissett to uh, don, uh, you know, the city of Indianapolis with their greatness. Uh, Doug McDermott. Uh, also was great. He was four from six from beyond the arc. And then pretty much like a complete 180, they go out against the Wizards and lose 142 to 115. So as badly as they beat the Hornets in the first game, that's how badly they got beat uh, by the Wizards uh, in the second game. The Wizards had a commanding lead at halftime, 66 to 52, and then put 48 points up in the third quarter, nearly a 50 burger in that third quarter. Malcolm Brogdon, 24 points. Uh, Bradley Beal had 25 points and five rebounds. Um, 18 points, eight rebounds, and 15 assists. Nearly a triple double uh, for Russell Westbrook. So the Pacers officially eliminated from the postseason. Um, so their season is over. Uh, and so, you know, the big question on everybody's mind as we switch gears over to the offseason is what is the future of the head coaching situation? Who is going to be uh, leading this team into battle next fall? Um, and so as of right now, it's Nate Bjorkren. Uh, and so the, the first kind of question is can the wounds – uh, be healed between Nate Bjorkren and this team, and you you shake your head no, and I would be inclined to believe you. But here's the thing: well, for one, we are now what about uh, five ish days removed from the Pacers' loss, so uh, you know maybe four days, something like that, half a week, um, and so still nothing has happened. Now I don't know if you know I don't know if again they might be waiting or something like that but I mean if it was if it was such a bad toxic locker room I feel that would be a okay as soon as you know as soon as the clock hits triple zeros hey bud you're out of here like that's what you know kind of the feeling I would have especially in the NBA when we see guys get fired after a bad 2 weeks um, you know, you see a new head coach hired and then they, a team starts out, you know, six and 16 and they're like, oh, well, you know what? You're obviously terrible. You need to get out of here. So I, I was kind of thinking along that, those lines. So I think the longer this goes, the longer it could be potentially a situation where they bring him back. I mean, even Kevin Pritchard came out today. If you're listening to this on the podcast, it's just, it was yesterday that he came out and said that he is non-committal on whether or not he's going to fire Nate Bjorkren or if he's going to keep him on. And, I mean, you know, there was a Bleacher Report article by Adam Wells that said that, uh, you know, that reported that Doug McDermott is on the record saying that the team is lucky to have Bjorkren. Now, McDermott is in a contract year, um, so he could be saying whatever he needs to say to possibly get re-signed, although I think the Pacers should and, and could do that. Um and, you know, honestly, most of the issues on the record in that May 6th article that we talked about last week was with the staff, not necessarily the players. Um, it, it was also reported that Bjorkren is willing to work on the concerns uh, that uh, others may have about him. Uh, his contract is up after the 21-22 season with a club option for 22-23. So they could theoretically say, you know what, let's just run it back and see what happens and if if nothing works out, then we'll just can them after next season. Um, you know, so they could just you know, and, and only take immediate action if it's massively worse uh, next year. And then of course, you know, I talked about it being a mainly you know staff issue with uh, who was having the issues with Bjorkren. The one main concern was T.J. Warren, who demanded who was uh, reportedly demanded a trade after Bjorkren was hired. He came out today or, uh, you know, over the past day or so and basically said, you know what, I, I didn't say that. I want to be here. I want to be here for a long time. Um, so, and, but, and, and he, this is a guy who's also on record uh, saying that he's, you know, is excited to be back with the Pacers next season. Uh, if he does indeed have an issue with Bjorkren, 
the Pacers could end up trading him away, especially if the locker room isn't 100% sold on, uh, you know, what the actual situation is. If it's not, if it's kind of like a 50-50 split in the locker room or, you know, uh, one or two guys that have the main issue, they could end up getting rid of those guys and just keeping the main core of the team. I do think they will end up firing Bjorkren, um, and I don't know who they end up replacing him with, but you talk about could the wounds heal, I honestly think... Um, I honestly think they could be healed just because it's not it's not a cut and dry look. He's you know, he's done X, Y, and Z and he's out. It's it's been, well, he, you know, he's had a lot of issues, but he's willing to address them. But you know, a lot of the issues have been with staff, but the players that have had troubles with him have said, Hey, you know what? You know, I have no problem, we're good, let's run it back next year. So it's not necessarily a cut and dry, he's definitely out situation. I'm not saying I'm persuaded to, to be, you know, I'm not saying that I've you know, been persuaded that I don't think he should be fired. I still think he should be, especially, you know, after that initial article and now all of a sudden everybody's running it back. But especially in the NBA, where we just dealt with not really a similar situation, but a rela a comparable situation with Victor Oladipo did he say did he actually go up to another other teams and say hey I can't wait to play with you guys next year or is that just all baloney so you don't really know exactly what the situation is especially when you're getting mixed signals of hey he's he's a first year head coach he's really abrasive but he's willing to work on it and then players that are like oh the players want him out oh but then they go out and say outwardly like hey I didn't say that we want to run it back next year. So it's it's just it's a confusing situation. So I think especially because the Pacers are are not a, you know, ha, you know can sometimes have a, you know, hard time making, you know, a decision that might be the right one <laughs> in situations like these. I just I don't have 100% confidence that they will move, move on from Bjorkgren after this season. I honestly believe they cannot be healed. After word broke, I mean, if they bring him back, I feel like you've lost the confidence of the fans. You know, like, oh my gosh, this guy couldn't get a defensive scheme to save his life. You know, it, it, it's one thing, like, if there's rumors that the players don't like them, okay, you figure that out. But it's not just the players. It's other people within the front office that say he's hard to work with. I mean, there was a, an assistant coach that left in the middle of the season because of how hard he was to work with. You know, you can't have that. And the Pacers are in a position right now, even Kevin Pritchard said today, which is kind of interesting take what he said, not about York, Yorkman, but just about the whole, pay, about the team in general. He, has, he either wants to be in or out. Meaning, I want to be contending or I don't. And none of this I, well it's also kind of stating that and those are the two options right <laughs> well hanging around in the middle like right. The right right now is extremely frustrating because you're too good to get good draft picks but you're not good enough to be contending for a championship you, wh where are you you're kind of in no man's land and so i guess i mean is a potential rebuild on the horizon is that an option for the Pacers, I, I don't think so, because you see these teams going to rebuild, and they're stuck in rebuild purgatory forever. And the Pacers are not a destination by any stretch of the imagination for free agents, big name free agents. So you're not getting yourself out of it through that. So there's, you know, I don't think they're heading to a rebuild, but I do believe Nate Bjorkren is going to be fired. That is a step they have to take. Um, I do not believe Kevin Pritchard is going to be fired. I think he's still going to be stuck around. Um, and I, the reason I don't think he's been fired yet is it's a bad look for you as an organization to, for the longer you go without a new hire. Everybody wants you to have that new hire. And you may be starting to do your background work right now while you still have your upgrade to see who may be available, to see what, what you know what's possible before you make a move like this. And like you said, he's non-committal at this point, which could also mean, hey, the, the person that we want 
we can't talk to right now because they're still coaching in the playoffs. Well, once they become available for us to talk to them, then we can make moves. So yeah, you're not, you're not going to fire the coach now and just sit there without a coach for a while. You're, you're not going to do that. That's not a, a good thing to do. Um, honestly, I, I'm still very, I'm very much, if it like, I know you didn't, you didn't, you haven't said this yet, but you said a potential name is Mark Jackson. And if somebody like that is somebody that you're looking at, um, then you're firing Nate Bjorkman and making the move now. But because you're, you haven't made the move yet, you're non-committal at this point. It means you're doing your homework on some candidates that you are interested in. You may still be coaching. Makes me, but I do. I'm still riding the train of Brad Stevens because even Kevin or even um, Danny Ainge came out and said he's committed to Brad Stevens, and Brad Stevens is committed to the Celtics. Vote of confidence there. That's always a killer. Not like Brad Stevens has done anything worthy of being fired, but you know it just may be time for a change of scenery. Like same thing the Pacers said when they got rid of Frank Vogel. It was just time to go separate directions for both of us. Um, so, well, and that Celtics team too. I mean, not to the fault of Stevens, but that Celtics team is just gen- generally like year after year gotten worse as far as the personnel. I mean, w- at one point, you know, they had Kyrie, they had Gordon Hayward. I know Kyrie didn't play uh, and Hayward because of injury. They both didn't, you know, end up on the court. But you know, we, they went from having a team that was contending for the Eastern Conference Finals to now they barely get in the playoffs. So, right, and I still think they. He was. They were set up for failure with Kyrie. I still don't think Kyrie is. Um, he's a really, really good player, but I don't think he's the best locker room guy, and that's tough. I think uh, you know having Jason Kidd or is it? No, it's Steve Nash who's their coach in Brooklyn, right? I think he knows how to. He, you know, he's a former point guard and played uh, with big personalities and everything. Knows how to handle that type of stuff. I don't think Brad Stevens fully understood how to handle a Kyrie Irving type personality in yeah. the locker room, which, you know, he got brought in all of a sudden. It's like, okay, here's your team. And one of them's Kyrie Irving. Good luck. Um, you know, so they did really well for all that considering. And now that he's got more experience, I still think a match between the Pacers and Brad Stevens is something is, is a really, really good fit for each party. We'll see. But I do believe Nate Bjorkman, it, it can't be fixed. It's out there in the public now, and the fans are already wavering on on this team. And if you run it back like it is, everybody's going to be like, why? Why? We, we just don't do anything. Honestly, I even read an article that's, or, that said, I forget the, who wrote it or where it was from, but somebody wrote that the biggest thing holding the Pacers back are the Simons, the owners of the team, because they they just want to own a team. They don't really want to invest in it. I mean, they have their invest. A banker's life is being invested in, but that's more so uh, because of the other. Apple. Yeah, I was gonna say the other the other <laughs> things the other things that go on at Banker's Life, all the concerts, yeah. the state finals, the yeah, NCAA tournament, tournament, the Big Ten tournament. Indianapolis investing in yeah. that more so than the Simons. And you know they don't want to go over. The, they don't want to get close to the luxury tax. They're just so. It it's the Simons that are really holding the Pacers back from being something special or being a, a a contender. But on the flip side, you know the Pacers are in a middling market where the fans are just kind of wishy washy now. And who's to say that somebody doesn't come in and you know, as a new owner, if the Simons do ever decide to sell, a new owner comes in and moves, the, they would move the Pacers. You know, because there, there's been, there has been rumbling in the past, not too distant past, of the Pacer, of a, the Pacers could move, and that, it never had any feet to it, it never took off there or anything, but it was always just kind of something that was hanging there. Um, so that's one of the issues you could possibly run into, but I don't know where else they would go where a mid, like a bigger market other than like maybe Seattle, but Seattle, yeah. I don't think you pick up the Pacers and take them to Seattle by any chance. You're not leaving the state of Indiana, which 
Yeah, I was gonna say. Basketball. I was gonna say I I would I would say Sacramento would be moved to Seattle before the Pacers would be. Um, as far as yeah, because it's weird too. Because like I feel like even if you move the team out of, it's kind of like exactly what happened with Charlotte. You had you know basically where Charlotte moved, and then you had Charlotte didn't get an expansion team. Like I feel like eventually you would. Well, not just that, but just from the sense of like, I feel like if you moved India out of Indiana, the NBA did, you'd eventually move back in. So what would the point be? Um, unless the com- like, I don't know, I don't know. All, I mean, all the powers the commissioner has. I know obviously um, he works for the owners, but I don't know if you could like put pressure on owners to do anything to be like, hey, you, you're kind of not the greatest owner. Let's let's move it along. Like, I don't know if you can do anything close to that, but like. Um, it, I, you possibly could, but what's the point with the Pacers? You're not a big market. You don't have any big name players. You just kind of exist. Yeah, and like, but that's the thing. The the, the problem right now is that like, and that's kind of what, where I'm at with like the wounds could be healed because for one. I'm not saying I want them to be like let's get that, let's get that out of the way first like I don't want them to be but could they be like I think there's legitimate weight to that because for one like every like I said everything was bad uh you know locker room wise but they still rallied and made the playoffs you had you basically have the same team coming back next year with a healthy Warren with you know a full season of Karis LeVert you have all that kind of working for you plus you know, a lot of players come off the books, including maybe Bjorngren, after next season. So, and because of the fact that the Pacers are kind of in basketball limbo and kind of literally can't do, like, they can't, they're unless they want to trade, they just basically have to just be like, well, either we tank and get players that way, or we just maybe, like, hope that a star player just falls into our lap at some point. Because that's the... Because a, the mindset of NBA players is the mindset of like the nineteen like sixties, where like the only way we'll get noticed is if we go to a big market. Like, no, it won't. You can go to literally any team and you'll be fine. Like, I don't know where it became like, oh, the only way I can have. I mean, I understand like living there. Like, obviously, that's that's a big draw. Like, to living in Miami or LA as opposed to living in Indianapolis. But also, you gotta re- also think a lot of these players want to go down to Florida, like to Miami. I'm su- surprised even Orlando isn't a, a destination because of this. There's no income tax, right? Yeah, yeah. So they well, make more money down in Florida. Isn't it the same in Texas? Like, why are the Spurs and Rockets not, you know, getting no, better play? Like, you know, Miami is South Beach. You're right. It's just a, it's a destination to live. Right. But, so like so like the NBA and we're gonna talk about this. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more in our NBA playoff predictions. But like the NBA, the NBA is in a great spot like TV wise, which I guess that's what pulls in the you know that's what makes it a huge thing and and makes a lot of the money. But like at the same like because it's great because you can basically create all star teams and that's what they want. So like obviously it's fine. But it's just like it's created the situation that unless you're in a big market, there's literally no reason. There's no way. It's not like because at least in like baseball or football, you can go out and you can you can be you know the Seattle Mariners and go sign you know a big name player. You can be you know you can be the Green Bay Packers and go trade for Julio Jones. Like it's not out of you know or sign whoever. Like there's no you know. There's no like, oh well, I don't want to go play in Green Bay because it's Green Bay, Wisconsin instead of you know New York, like or else the Jets and the Giants would be a heck of a lot better. So like, you know, it's just so weird to me. And I mean, I guess it's because it's more player driven in the NBA, but still, like, it's just the NBA is in a perfect spot for what makes them their money, but in a such a terrible spot if you are a fan. Like the it's it's. The NBA is the casual fans' favorite sport. The casual sports fans' favorite sports because all they care about are the big name players, and so that's all they and that's all they get to see. They get to tune out all these other teams that don't that can't afford to get those bigger players. 
So it doesn't matter. But then, like, you have us who are like, man, we're just, like, like two pieces away. Like, why can't we just get – why can't we go out and sign, like, we literally – like hell, you don't need a big, big, big name, you right? Don't. Right, but what I'm saying is that like, you know, heck, we made a, a great case for like why LeBron. I mean, I know this was an exaggerated example even then, but like why LeBron should come to Indiana. But we all we all knew that was you know just kind of banter because like never in a million years would you know there over the time that like Kevin Durant visited Indiana, like we all knew he wasn't gonna go there. He wasn't gonna go to indiana but like because oh well apparently indiana since it's a small market isn't a place where he can win when literally the, this is a pacers team that i mean for what it's worth has had years and years of sustained success as far as making it to the playoffs every year you could literally add add like one or two star players to the pacers even if it's just one like top 15 player and they're in the eastern conference finals and vis-a-vis paul george like or not in the nba finals but like the eastern conference finals they're right on the cusp of the finals so i don't know it, it the nba from that standpoint is just broken and it's just kind of sad because like i don't know i don't know what the pacers do like it's kind of what i'm saying like heck let's go ahead and and talk about you know what they might do in the offseason like i don't know like what what they're you know they you know, oh wait, well quick before we move on to that though, um, I, I said Mark Jackson as far as who I think the Pacers should look at because I was like I was looking through uh, eight points nine seconds. Uh, they had an article on who the Pacers should focus on um, as far as like potential replacements for Bjorkgren, and uh, they brought up Mark Jackson for I mean for one familiarity with the organization, coached and played for the for the team. Um, and I, did, I didn't even think about this, but he was the coach before Steve Kerr in Golden State. He helped develop that young core. I mean, I don't know if we're necessarily giving him credit for Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and all those guys. But at the same time, like, he helped, like, kind of nurture those talents, which the Pacers are a very young team. So that – and that was what we loved about Nate Bjorkren when he was coming in was that, like, oh, he has got all this G League experience. The Pacers are a young team. Maybe he can – kind of use that and develop that young talent i think mark jackson could potentially do that so that's why i brought him up and but you are right i mean they would have already done that if uh you know if that were the case they would have already fired bjorkman and hired mark jackson because there's no reason to wait on that right and same thing i think isn't dan tony he's not coaching right now either right that's which that's which good <laughs> right um but yeah, so you're looking at the Pacers like pre-draft options. Right now, they're sitting at 120 mil on the books for the 21-22 season. They are 16.6 uh, mil under the cap for next year. Uh, really, the big, the main big names that are off, um, off the books next season are T.J. McConnell and Doug McDermott. So when you're thinking about what they should do, um, I mean, basically just run it back next year. I mean, I think they. They need to, um, you know, they could, like I said, they could essentially bring back the entire roster back from this year, be still under the cap. I think they'll get, you know, a couple of, um, you know, a couple of role players. If they sign anybody, that's what they'll do. Um, They'll get a couple of, you know, because when I was reading through, like, potential targets for the Indiana Pacers, I was like, I don't like any of these names. (laughs) I don't, uh, none of these names. Right, exactly. So I was like, Basically, the main concern for me is just they re-sign McConnell and McDermott. I mean, if you have to prioritize one, McConnell. Um, and then I think they need to tr- – like, I, if they want to be a playoff team, if they, wanna, if they are going to say instead of just – if they are going to, like, commit to, like, hey, we're going to be a – we want to be – you know, take that next step, I think they do still need to trade somebody, whether that be Warren if he does have an issue with Bjorgren or well, but I'm just I'm saying if they keep Bjorkren, if you if you keep Bjorkren and trade Warren, fans are done. Fans check out. Like, are you serious? You can fire Nate Bjorkren and get somebody else. T.J. Warren is a good basketball player. Yeah, that's on the cheap right now. You do not trade that away. You fire the coach that nobody wants around. Secretly, nobody wants around. Yeah, and if, but if you trade Warren, that's basically telling the fans it is what it is. We just, we just, we don't care. Yeah. And guess what? The fans in turn will say, all right, you don't care. Guess what? We don't care either. 
we are not buying your expensive tickets to come watch a poor product on the court. Right. Not happening. So, yeah, so they need to trade one of the two. I only brought up Warren because if they keep Bjorkren, but, you know, that's just that. But I think they also, we've talked about them trading Miles Turner for a while. I think if you're going to take that next step, you need to trade somebody. And, I, I mean, just to go and get that, you know, other talent that you're looking to go get. Um, I don't know I don't know what the move is. I was, I, you know, I don't know. I was trying to find, you know, you know, some good, like, possible trade options. I couldn't really find that when I was doing some digging. There wasn't really any, because, I mean, I, I guess it's because, you know, it's everything's more focused to the playoffs now, so there's not a lot of rumors as far as who um, could potentially trade for Miles Turner. But, yeah, it's just, I, I think they need to trade one of those two, I mean, really, Turner, um, and, and, and make a move that way. But, yeah, they're, they're kind of stuck with, uh, you know, running it back, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, they got a good roster, uh, but if they want to take that next step, I think they need to trade somebody. All right, so sign-in trades are going to be a big deal, I think, for the Pacers. That's the way they handle this. I, you, you have, one, you have to re-sign TJ McConnell, in my opinion. He's too good of a locker room guy. He's a great depth piece. He goes out there and he just does the right things for the team. He doesn't force anything. He's just a team player. And players like that are invaluable, in my opinion. And they're too far in between. There's there's not enough of them out there, to be honest. And TJ McConnell is a, a I feel like is a dying breed. A, a team first guy that just whatever he, I mean, he's a coach's kid. Same with McDermott. But so you gotta re-sign McConnell. Then you take Jeremy Lamb, who's going into a contract year, and a 2021 second-round pick, package that up, send it to Chicago for a sign-in trade of Lori Merkanen, power forward. That is one of the areas the Pacers are kind of weak at, is power forward, because right now your starting power forward is Domas Sabonis, who is more of a five than a four. So there, you fix that problem. Jeremy Lamb is, you know, he's he's a good player, but he's just been too injured for the Pacers. It may be a good time for a change of scenery. He's going to be a type of player that the Chicago Bulls would like because he's coming off the cap at the end of this year when the cap kind of goes up again, and they may be players in free agency. Be a good backup to uh, Zach Levine as well. Second trade you do, for sure. Uh, you take – see who was oh you take you, you re-sign doug mcdermott and you take a 2022 second round pick package that up send it to the um, miami heat for a sign and trade of kendrick nunn kendrick nunn then slides in as a depth piece for uh jeremy lamb you know and lori mccann lori mccann comes in and kind of a fill in for doug mcdermott uh both of these players have higher upsides than uh, mcdermott and lamb and you know with none and mark Hannon. and those two have higher upsides they're more athletic and they're also younger so you are um you're basically filling those spots back in but with better depth talent than what you currently have and you're not giving up a whole lot you do have to get rid of nate Bjorkren. i say go after brad stevens and in doing that there is a possibility that you still could trade miles turner for uh, to Charlotte, you know Charlotte really wants him. To Charlotte, you could try to land Gordon Hayward, if you. I mean, or you try to run. You try to run the starting five back. But you've up. You've upgraded your off the bench depth, like talent wise. You've upgraded there. The only other position I could see that you may try to move because teams want him, but I'm not too high on him. Aaron Holiday. Um. He may be somebody that you could you could move. However, looking at other possible trade scenarios, depending on where the, the Pacers land draft pick wise, it looks like they may be around 12, 10 to 12. Um, you could always potentially then take your 10, 11, 12 pick, whatever it is, and Miles Turner, package it to somebody else that's higher up and, you know, go get somebody else or, or you can package Aaron holiday with your pick or whatever it may be, go up and get a, a new point guard or whatever it may be. I don't know. Another player that you could potentially see on the move, which kind of seems crazy is Malcolm Brogdon. I think we have seen the best there is from Malcolm, Malcolm Brogdon. 
and it's i don't know i feel like there's potentially better options out there you could move him for a higher draft pick in my opinion and still keep your current draft pick um that's a that's a big option there as well or you know you package you know you can put together some sort of package to move up and still be able to keep your 10 11 or 12 pick whatever wherever they end up landing so th- there are options. It's just Kevin Pritchard needs to move and work these options. You know, don't just sit back and run it back. So if you if you do run it back, that just shows that tells the fans you're just not invested in it. You don't care, and in turn the the fans won't care either. So they have to make some moves this year. Yeah, and I mean it doesn't sound like he's going to just run it back because from what he's no. saying about like oh we're kind because that's it, what, the way what he said today was basically how like I feel like where they're just kind of in limbo and you know they could be they could be you know back to what we're used to where they're like in the middle of the Eastern Conference playoff hunt or they're I mean, I'm even okay if they're in the middle of the Eastern Conference playoff hunt I don't want to be on the fringe middling outskirts yeah looking in or fighting our way in you know where it's like oh man if we just don't worry about getting you're at that point where you just don't you don't want to get in so you get a better draft pick but if you're fighting for the four or five seed i'm okay with that you know i mean if yeah i want to be better but i feel like at least then you are in the conversation at least if you're in the four or five seed range but right. anything below that, it's just kind of like six. You're still feeling okay, but seven and eight, you're just like, don't, don't, just. Don't we, we barely made it. <laughs> don't even that. do it. Don't just, just let somebody else be that team that misses out on better player opportunities because they got in as a seven or eight seed and got their butts kicked in the first round. Like, what's the point? There is no point to that. I agree. Well, you know, I think it, I'm, I'm interested to see what the Pacers do uh, this off season. Um, I think the main, you know the main thing we're kind of hoping to see is you know hopefully they move on from Bjorkren and then we'll kind of see where they go from there. So uh, it will be a uh, fun storyline to follow. Um, we'll get into the playoffs here in just a second, but before that, let's go ahead and hear from our friends of the show. The Crash Course Podcast is brought to you by Anchor. Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to start? Look no further than Anchor.fm. Anchor allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your computer or mobile device and will distribute it to other sites such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. On a budget, not only is Anchor completely free of charge, but will allow you to make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor.fm to get started. Anchor, it's everything you need in a podcast in one place. Are you tired of your same old lunch hour of sitting and scrolling through your apps on your smartphone? Have you thought about playing a board game with your coworkers? Eat Lunch and Board Game is a podcast dedicated to telling you about board games that are great for lunchtime fun and some that are probably better saved for after work hours. I've been playing games at my office for over four years now where I have made new friends and business connections that have been very useful. Board games build bridges. Also, remember, guys, that you can like us on Facebook, Crash Course Podcast. Follow us over on Twitter, at Crash Course FM. Go to our YouTube channel, uh, 3C Media on YouTube. Uh, You guys have been crushing it lately with the support. Um, You can also catch not only this uh, podcast every Tuesday, the video version, but you can also catch the MCT podcast that comes out uh, every single weekend. You guys have been supporting that like crazy, too. Those guys have been doing a great job, so keep on uh, doing what you're doing. We're at 31 subscribers, so hey, let's get to 50. I, I think we uh, that's a, a good possibility, so uh, you know, I, you know, know, I we appreciate all your support on that. And remember, you can watch us record live every week on twitch.tv slash 3C Media. You can interact with us just like Dusty does pretty much every week. Dusty always in that chat. Uh, he wants to know... Uh, for one, he asked us if Jimmy Johnson's going to be in the 500. Unfortunately, no. I wish he was. Um, next year. Yeah, next, year. ne- next year's probably a better bet. I, I kind of wish he was, though, in this year's. Um, and then uh, he also asked where we think Julio is going to go. Julio Jones uh, said today, San, San Francisco. Ooh, I, see, I haven't, I haven't heard San Francisco. I was going to say what, whatever happens with Aaron Rodgers, that's where Julio should go. Uh, like. 
Who do you think? Ooh, you think Aaron Rodgers is San Francisco and then Julio? I think so. I mean, that's... I don't think it's going to be the Colts. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, I... too expensive, and we know what we know what's coming up for the Colts as far as signings go. You got three big names. You got to you got to yeah resign the long term contracts, and you need to pay them. Um, so Does... I don't. I, I don't think it's going to happen for the Colts, unfortunately, especially considering Pat McAfee asked Chris Ballard in a text, and Ballard laughed it off. <laughs> uh, Dusty says he thinks the Patriots. I mean, that's always a good a good guess as well, just because uh, Bill Belichick. But that's the one everybody wants, though. Yeah. That's the one the media is all like, oh, the Patriots, the Patriots, the Patriots. Why? Because they need the Patriots to be good because <laughs> They're like... the, it's – it's weird for them to not have the Patriots be good. True. I don't, I, I think there's too many question marks around that. Uh, can Cam Newton stay healthy for an entire year? Yeah. And then you're going to, you're going to have Mac Jones too. Like even, even if Julio goes to new England, there's no guarantee that that team will be like, cause I mean, they a, still might be you want just a dark horse though. You want a dark horse for that? DeAndre Hopkins has come out and stated he would restructure his contract to be make it much more team friendly for them to land Julio Jones. That would Could be. Could you imagine a wide receiving core of DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones, and Rondale Moore? Yeah, that's in Arizona. That's sick. That with Kyler Murray running the show. I mean, uh, Rondale Moore is going to be on the practice squad, so we don't have to worry about that. But uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm joking. You, you, don't, you don't draft a player in the second round <laughs> I, for a practice. I squad. know. I just like to say that because he's, you know, he's a Purdue guy and you're a Purdue guy, so it's it's always good to. Now, if he got drafted to like the fourth or fifth, maybe the fifth round, yeah. Like, there's, yeah, you're probably right. But second round, you're not you're not putting no. a guy up from the second round on the practice squad for sure. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Um, but we're also uh, super hyped to get into some NBA predictions. It's uh, the NBA playoffs. So uh, we do this every year. We let like the first weekend percolate, and then we kind of uh, get into our predictions. So uh, here are, uh, in case you, you don't know, here are the matchups here. First in the Eastern Conference, you have the one-seeded uh, Philadelphia 76ers. They're taking on the eight-seeded Washington Wizards. Um, and they uh, Philadelphia is 1-0 and in that series. Um, you've got the uh, New York Knicks, the four seed, going up against the five seed Atlanta Hawks. Atlanta won game one in that series. Three seed Milwaukee taking on the six seeded Miami Heat. Milwaukee won game one. Uh, and then after having a lead, the seven seeded uh, Celtics uh, lost to uh, the Nets uh, in, in game one. The Celtics led for a while in that game, but the Nets came back and win. Over the Western Conference, you have the number one Utah Jazz against the eight Memphis, Grizz Memphis Grizzlies. Memphis, uh, who has does have experience winning from the eighth seed. Um, I mean, obviously, just, well, yeah, I was going to say completely different team, but still, I mean, the franchise like itself. Zach Randolph, yeah. Mark Gasol, Mike Conley. Yeah. Long time ago. Yes. Uh, uh, they lead that series one to nothing. Dallas. Um, Taking game one from the Clippers, that's the 4-5 matchup. Portland, 1-0 over uh, the Nuggets, that's the 3-6. And then Phoenix, the two seed, taking on LeBron and the Lakers. Uh, Phoenix took game one. Saw a funny meme, um, uh, uh, you know, all the memes about <laughs> the Lakers dropping game one um, of that series. So uh, it's time to get into our predictions, uh, who we think is going to win. Uh, we'll go... I'll go first. We'll kind of do what we do for the NCAA tournament. I'll go first round, then you go B. Scott, then we'll alternate that way. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into it, starting with the Eastern Conference. Uh, first round, uh, 76ers and Wizards. Um, just like in game one, uh, the 76ers have won all three matchups between the Wizards uh, with, with the Wizards uh, this season. Uh, Embiid you know, basically went off in all those games, averaging... Uh, you know, <laughs> he's uh, gone off in all those matchups on the season. Embiid's averaging 29 points, 11 rebounds. He's in the MVP conversation. Uh, easy pick here. I think the 76ers advance. You've got the Nets over Celtics. I mean, the Celtics are kind of, I mean, maybe worrying it, you know, saying they're in shambles is kind of a little aggressive. But uh, also, I mean, they've they, got injury issues. They've got injury issues. In they, they lost. They really good young talent. They, they just. They lost a lot going into the playoffs, and so I, I think Jaylen that Brown, right? That's huge, right? That's essentially like if you go back to when the Pacers were actually contenders, and um, 
David West went out with an injury. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, that's a t- it's not your best player, but that's your second best player. And on the flip side, there the Nets basically have uh, an All Star team. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the Nets win that series. Uh, I've got the uh, Bucks over the Heat. Uh, the Bucks were eliminated as the one seed last year by the Heat in five games, so I think they've got a little bit of a revenge uh, vendetta out for the Heat. The Heat aren't necessarily as strong as they were because the Heat were starting to pick up steam in the bubble last year and carried that on into the postseason and parlayed that into an NBA Finals appearance. I don't think that's going to be the case this year. Um, so uh, I think Milwaukee wins that series. Um, and then I've got, I mean, I know it kind of faltered, uh, in uh, in game one, but I do have the Knicks over the Hawks. Um, of course, we talked about the Pacers a lot. Nate McMillan, former coach of the Pacers, is now the coach for the Hawks. Nate McMillan has, in 16 years of coaching, has only advanced out of the first round in one postseason series. That's 2005 with the Seattle Sonics. Uh, he's lost in the first round eight of nine postseason appearances. So uh, you're going against the grain if you're going the Hawks here. I am going to go with the Knicks uh, advancing uh, out of the Eastern Conference first round. So my first round, um, you know, I'm actually going with the Wizards over the 76ers, mostly because the Wizards are playing really, really good basketball right now, and they're very, they're very confident. Um, Westbrook is playing like his former self, which is huge, and it's really helping uh, Bradley Beal as well. So I'm going to go with the upset there of the eight over the one. Um, I have the Nets over the Celtics. Same reasons, the Nets are essentially an all-star team. Uh, I do have the Bucks over the Heat. The Bucks are a much better team this year. They're kind of seem like a team on a mission. And I do have the Knicks over the Hawks. The Knicks are surprisingly good this year. Let's go for it. And also, it's Nate McMillan in the first round. <laughs> yeah. so you proved me wrong. Right, yeah, exactly. See, because that's the thing. That's that's the great thing about predicting the NBA and kind of the sad part and sad – I mean, you want the NBA is probably the most successful sport at the moment. I mean, maybe the second most behind the NFL – but just from a just a popularity standpoint, but they're also yeah, like it's it's so it's so like boring to pick sometimes because it's like well I want to go you know this route, but it's like nah you gotta you gotta go with the safe pick because it's probably gonna be that, and that's kind of like just pick what you know is probably gonna happen, which is David Mills is gonna lose in the first round. Uh, the Nets are an All Star team, so that's the only reason to pick them to go like. Well, all right, cool. Kind of takes the fun out of making those selections. Um, it takes the fun out of watching it too. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, I haven't, I haven't watched a bit of the first, of the playoffs so far, and I probably won't. Yeah. Um, well, let's move on with these predictions that <laughs> it's into the second round uh, of the Eastern Conference playoffs, the Eastern Conference semis. Uh, it's uh, 76ers against the uh, the Knicks for me. Uh, the Knicks haven't advanced out of the second round since 1999, uh, 2000, that season. Uh, and the Knicks and the 76ers uh, swept the season series. So uh, I think that's where the, you know, you know the Knicks are kind of like that team uh you know in the in the ncaa tournament where it's like oh that's a fun team that made it and then like this is where they kind of run into that juggernaut where you're like yeah maybe maybe this is where the story ends so 76ers win that one and the nets um over the bucks now even if even if the nets didn't have like the uh, eastern conference all-star team uh as their roster i would still go with the nets here just because the bucks the bucks have turned into what the raptors used to be which is the team that just can't seem to get over the hump so as much as you'd like to say hey maybe with Giannis, maybe with you know a game they take a game or two here or there like the bucks are just a team that even when you know even if they were projected to you know carry their weight in this series you know, they still would falter inevitably. So I'm going with the uh, Nets over the Bucks, which sets up the 76ers and the Nets in the Eastern Conference Finals. So for my semis, I have the Wizards versus the Knicks and the Nets versus the Bucks. I have the Wizards over the Knicks. Um, the Knicks are just a young team. They're still trying to figure themselves out, whereas I think the experience of Westbrook um, is going to prevail here and really help propel the Wizards. And then the Nets over the Bucks. There, If there is a team in the East that can 
stop the Nets, I think it would be the Bucks, just because they play sound defense. But there's just too many weapons for the Nets. Just too many. I, yeah. So Nets. Yeah, and so that, sets up a, that sets up an Eastern Conference Finals for me of the Nets and the Wizards. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, you know, and what's crazy, too, is that they're all healthy, too. So, like, there's not even, like, oh, well, they got to wait on Durant to come back, or they have to wait on Harden to come back, or they have to wait on Kyrie to come back. Um, or Griffin, or yeah. DeAndre Jordan. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Any, you know, name an, uh, an all-star at one point for uh, the NBA, and you got the Nets uh, roster right now. But, uh anyway. But yeah, so like it's not even like oh well maybe with this player out because I mean if Dur- like for instance if Durant were out like I think it'd be a little bit of a different story. You might have maybe maybe uh, you know the Nets faltering uh, before this point, but they're just they're all healthy and they're all amazing you know top ten top fifteen caliber players top twenty. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Eastern Conference Finals Nets against the 76ers. I've got the Nets advancing to the NBA Finals out of the Eastern Conference. Um, you know, the conference semis would be the furthest the 76ers. Uh, another team, just like the Bucks, that struggled to get over the hump um, have been since the 2001 NBA Finals. That was with Allen Iverson. Um, so, I mean, that's the thing. The top of the East, in addition to the Nets being so good, I'm not trying to be a broken record, but it's true. Um, you know, um, even, you know, if, you know, even without the fact that the Nets are amazing, the top of the Eastern Conference is laden with teams that have a history of not being able to perform in crunch time. Like, the only reason I have the Sixers going as far as they do is because their first two matchups are the Wizards and the Knicks, um, two teams that they should, at least on paper, beat. Like, if they honestly, to me, if they would have played like the Celtics first round, that, like, that's a team that always gives them trouble, I may have picked the Celtics. Um, just because, I mean, the 76ers, the Bucks, I mean, these are all teams that typically just, for whatever reason, can't, you know, seem to get over the hump. And so that just kind of makes it easier to pick the Nets to, uh, r- to run the table and go through the Eastern Conference. Yeah, I got the Nets advancing to the finals as well. I just don't see, I mean, I have them against the Wizards in the conference <laughs> finals. You made it easy, so, easy on them. Yeah, well... <laughs> I still think the toughest round they're going to run into is the semis against the Bucks. Now I'll say, I think honestly, the, the team that comes out of that series is the team that will go on to represent the East in the finals. I will say this: I mean, if there's if there's one player that can will his team to win, especially based on kind of a personal vendetta, it's Russell West, Westbrook going up against Durant and Harden. Oh, yeah. Like being like, okay, you guys need to both team up. Well, then guess what? I'm just going to, hey, everybody, get on my back. I'm going to carry everybody <laughs> to the NBA Finals. So, I mean, if there's yeah. one player that can, you know, basically be a one-man wrecking crew when he needs to be, that's Russell Westbrook. So, I mean, who and you knows? you got Bradley Beal. True. With him. Right. I mean, between those two, they can put up close to like 70 points a game. Right, right. I mean, the, the rest of the guys just kind of have to – chip in yeah so <laughs> they're like you guys keep doing you we're gonna we'll, we'll come in every once in a while uh moving over to the western conference now first round uh jazz and grizzlies i do have despite the grizzlies uh winning game one i do have the jazz winning i um, not gonna overthink it the jazz were the, the best team in the nba Careful, this though. season i mean donovan mitchell still has yet to play true very true um, I'm not happy about it. Hey, but you know what? I got to make amends because at the beginning of the season, I'm pretty sure when we predicted playoff teams for the Western Conference, I left the Jazz completely out. Um, so, so I mean, uh, I, I to make amends for that, I have to have them advancing um, out of out of the first round. Uh, Lakers uh, against the Suns. I do have the Lakers winning over Phoenix. LeBron has never lost the first round, uh, and the team is underachieved at this point. So I think they you know they've come in a little bit hot going into these playoffs. So I do have them beating the Suns. Three versus the six Nuggets and Blazers. Hey, I feel a little bit vindicated in the fact that the Blazers did win Game One. The Blazers have won seven and nine. Uh, since the uh, calendar turned to May, and I just have a hunch. I mean, it, it, for whatever reason, you know, we talk about teams in the Eastern Conference that can't get over the hump. The Blazers are another one of those teams that doesn't really go super far in the playoffs, but I feel like Dame is just good for one or two series wins. Like, he's just, you know, you know, seems to have that clutch gene and can just will his team to at least win the first uh, series 
uh, on the on the schedule. So I've got the Blazers winning there, and then I also have uh, the Mavericks over the Clippers. Uh, just kind of a flip of the coin here. Uh, the, the Clippers have you know an impressive roster, but they haven't played super impressive this season. And the Mavericks, I think I'm you know, I'm just going with something a little bit different. I think the Mavericks win um, and advance to the second round. So I do have the Jazz over the Grizzlies as well in round one. The Jazz will figure it out, and I think Donovan Mitchell will eventually come back. If he doesn't come back in this round, it's definitely round two. I'm actually going to go with the Suns over the Lakers. I feel like the Suns are a very dangerous team, and Chris Paul's got something to prove, it feels like, this year. I feel like Chris Paul, everybody's overlooking him, and he's feeling disrespected by that. Um, Blazers, I do have the Blazers over the Nuggets as well. Um like you said, Dame is good for a couple of series wins here and there. I am going with the Mavericks as well over the Clippers. Um, they're just kind of – the Clippers are one of those teams that they, they think they're a whole lot better than they really are. Let's just be honest, you know. Uh, what, 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 Basically, the personification, the, the personification of Paul George thinks yeah. they're better than they actually are. Yeah. So, Mavs over the Clippers. Um and that's my first round. There you go. Moving on to the Western Conference semifinals, um, I do have the Jazz over the Mavericks, especially if Mitchell comes back. Uh, if Mitchell doesn't, which I don't know the nature of him being out, but um, uh, if he doesn't, then that's a whole different story. But again, kind of another toss-up for me, but the Jazz are just the better team on uh, both ends of the court. You know, I'm looking at their stats. You know, they're just, you know, they're better defensively. They put up more points. They got really good scores. Um, so I'm going to go with Jazz over the Mavericks. And then I do have the Lakers over the Blazers. Um, the Lakers do have the number one defense. They shut down, uh, which can shut down Lillard and McCollum, uh, much like they did in the playoffs last year. Um, so that sets up the Jazz and the Lakers in the Western Conference semis. Or uh, finals. Well, I'm going, yeah, I'm going with the, um, the Jazz over the Mavericks as well. I do believe Donovan Mitchell will be back by then. Um, I feel like he'll be back sooner rather than later. He's ready, and the Jazz are just kind of being cautious. So he'll be back by then. So Jazz over the Mavericks, but if not, def I got the Mavericks down over the Jazz. Kind of flip-flop. It all depends on Donovan Mitchell. But, we're, but right now we're going to pretend that he's playing. So, yes, Jazz over the Mavericks. And then I do have the, uh, the Blazers over the Suns um to get into the western conference finals so that sets up a conference finals for me of the jazz and the blazers <laughs> the, old school old yeah school. i was gonna That's say like the, the nba would not be happy because they're looking at it they're like man we really crossing our fingers that it's clippers lakers please clippers lakers and then it's the jazz and the blazers <laughs> like all right well uh, i guess we're just gonna have to Gonna have to deal just like the year it was like Oklahoma. Please, we got Brooklyn on the other side. Yeah, please. Yeah, imagine if they lost too, and it's like Milwaukee and Utah in the finals. Watch it, watch it end up being like Brooklyn versus Portland. <laughs> That's like the worst nightmare. Like, oh come on, can we just play every game in Brooklyn? <laughs> yeah. The NBA is open. <laughs> um. So the Western Conference Finals. Uh, my matchup is the Lakers and Jazz. Um. These two teams. It's interesting because. I wavered a little bit. I wanted, to, I really wanted to go. Well, you know, you know, I, I waffled back and forth. You know, the, these two teams haven't played at full force since February. Uh, the other two matchups were a back to back, and like LeBron didn't play, Anthony Davis didn't play. I'm pretty sure Donovan Mitchell, um, you know, and, and those guys didn't play in those other two games. Um, but it's just hard to bet against LeBron and Anthony Davis in a set in a seven game series. Not if Anthony Davis is playing the way he's playing. True, but I mean it's it's fine if, if they're to this point they've figured it out. Um, but I like so and that's the thing that's kind of what I'm going into uh, with you know and I'll, and I'll say this you know probably reiterate it when we go through our NBA finals but like that's the thing is just like as much as I want to say like oh the Jazz are you know the better all around team and they've got. You know, they're better at, you know, they're better scoring team. You know, yeah, it's like, you know, a good defense versus a good scoring team. So usually defense wins, but, if, you know, the Jazz, whatever. And, you know, LeBron's not going to be able to do it all. But at the end of the day, it's LeBron and Anthony Davis. So, like, <laughs> that's the, you know, juxtaposition you go against. Like, 
you know, yeah, the Jazz have this and that and the other, and then you're like, well, LeBron's on the other side. So I am going to go with LeBron and Anthony Davis. Um, uh, I, I like, As much as I want to go Jazz just to be different, I do think it's going to be the Lakers winning the Western Conference. So that sets up an NBA Finals of the Nets and the Lakers. The NBA super excited about that matchup. <laughs> so I got the Jazz and the Blazers. I'm going with the Jazz to make – the uh, NBA Finals, um, especially with Donovan Mitchell being healthy. I just think this team, they got something to prove as well. And they've been playing that way all season. So I got the Jazz setting up an NBA Finals of the Jazz versus the Nets. So Jazz and Nets for you. It's Nets, Lakers for me, NBA Finals. And again, like I said just a moment ago, it's the fact that, you know, the Nets just have more star power and firepower. I mean, it, it, instead of debating like, oh, well, then the Lakers are good on defense, but the Nets are better scorers, but, you know, this player matches up well with that player. It's like, all right, how many players, you know, when you're picking the NBA playoffs, it's like how many top five players do they have? How many top ten players you know, in the league right now, do they have how many top fifteen players? Okay, so if, if you know if if Team A has you know one top five player and two top ten players, well, you're going with that team. It doesn't matter what the other team. The other team could literally have you know the Monstars, and you're you're you know might as well just you know throw that out. You know, the team with the more you know the more star power, the more firepower is going to win. So that's like the kind of thing that kind of stinks about the NBA in the state that it is right now because it's literally like, hey guys, let's just go all win a ring. Doesn't matter. We, we're just all going to get on the same team and win a ring. And then it'll be, we're just like all taking turns <laughs> going to different places and teaming up and winning there. And, and so like, yeah, it's not about necessarily who's the better all around team. It's about, well, this team has two of the top five players in the game. So they're most likely going to win. So that's what's going to happen. And we also, I mean, I mean, even, there is some substance to it, too. I mean, we did see a similar team uh, to the Nets and as far as, like, makeup, um, as far as having a lot of star power uh, and what, uh, you know, that star power did to LeBron in 2017 and 18 because it was Durant and the Warriors um, in those years. And now it's, you know, who, you know, homegrown had an all-star team <laughs> that, that just, you know, grew its own talent into an all-star caliber team, uh, whereas they just kind of went out and plucked different players from different spots that were in bad situations. Um, the Nets did, uh, but we saw a team, you know, led by Durant in the Warriors go eight and one against, uh, LeBron and the Cavaliers in back-to-back -back finals. So, um, and that's what I think would happen here in this situation. So the Brooklyn Nets, uh, would end up being your 2021 NBA champions. Yeah. I have the Nets over the Jazz. I just think they're, like you said, too loaded. They're star loaded. Um, the only thing, though, the Jazz have some really good defensive players, and that could put throw a wrench in the video game style of play that the Nets employ. So, it could be a good series. I think it'd be it could ultimately end up being a good series, but I got the Nets winning it. All right, so we both have the Nets advancing, so we'll see if that ends up being what uh, it, what ends up playing out. Most likely it will. Um, but that's who we have winning uh, the uh, Larry O'Brien uh, later on this summer. So now it is finally time. Let's get into it. Talking about the Indianapolis 500. We uh, talked about qualifying last week. Uh, that took place over this past weekend. Uh, day one, Scott Dixon was the fastest on Saturday. Colton Herta and Tony Kanaan were set to round out the front row after day one. Will Power missed the cut on Saturday, was in danger of missing the 500, which, I mean, B. Scott was grinning wide. His arch nemesis might not get to run. Not really. I, didn't want to, I, didn't, I mean, I'm, I, I like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Penske fan. So I don't want to see. He's your like, arch nemesis, B. Scott. He's my arch nemesis. You know, <laughs> I didn't. I, you know, I was. I wanted him to make the race still, but I. I will say, like when when that. <laughs> It was it's strange to see a Penske car battling on that back end, I guess. Yeah, because what's weird is, like, I was thinking back, like, man, this is kind of like a couple years ago when Hinch 
Yeah, but I mean, Hinch wasn't with you know a a dominant team at the time. But I mean, it was still kind of crazy. I, I always like it's better for the drama if there's cars getting bumped and not just oh hey it's yeah. you know. But I also feel like really bad because like you you plan your whole especially for those one off teams like you plan your whole year around this moment and you like. You know, because at least, you know, Will Power, if he missed it, it would suck, but he's raced before, and, you know, he's racing the 500, won the 500, so, I mean, whatever, pack it up, it stinks, it stinks for now, but you get to pack up and come back at it next year, but, uh... I will say this, there wasn't much drama around the bumping. There was a noticeable difference between the three cars that got in and 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 then the two cars that got bumped out. Yeah. Like, they were just, like, R.C. Enerson was legitimately slower than the other three that got in um i can't remember who was the other charlie kimball charlie charlie kimball that one was probably a, a surprise to me as because that's somebody that's typically in the field yeah but running with Foyt, aj Foyt racing it, that's not a big surprise to see no. that they didn't have the speed right but with charlie, charlie kimball is usually somebody that you know he puts up like, you know, when he was, uh, when he has had the opportunities, he's actually put up really good race cars. I mean, he's put up good positions um, in the race. Yeah. So to see him not make the field was kind of a surprise to me. Um, like I said off air, I'm glad Simona made it because she is, she's a really good race car driver that people, you just overlook because the last time she was really big in IndyCar like full time, she was racing for Lotus and they were horrible. Um, there near the end but yeah I, I think Charlie Kimball not making it for me was probably a big that was a big surprise yeah so last row qualifying uh, it ends up being the last row is Sage Karam, Will Power and Simona Di Silvestro uh, Charlie Kimball um, and R.C. Anderson like you mentioned do get bumped then it was the fast nine on day two uh, Scott Dixon does earn the pole position the fourth time he will lead the Indy 500 to the green flag Colton Herta uh, and GMR Grand Prix went arenas VK round out row one and Carpenter, Tony Kanaan and Alex Pillow qualify for round two and Ryan Hunter Ray, Elio Castro Nevis and Marcus Erickson, Erickson round out the Fast 9. Other notable qual- qualifications, uh, Alexander Rossi is 10th, Pato Award is 12th, Takuma Sato, last year's winner, is 15th, James Hinchcliffe is 16th, Graham Rahal is 18th, Joseph Newgarden is 21st, and 25th is Marco Andretti. So, 15th Connor Daly. Connor Daly, 19th. So before we get into uh, our predictions for the race, uh, biggest surprise from qualifying, you know, you could say it's Will Power um, qualifying, uh, you know, in the last row. Although Penske, for the last few years, I feel like have been not the greatest in qualifying and then come back it's on race day. about the, the downforce. For some reason, Honda has figured out how to get the most downforce and everything out of their cars in uh, qualifying trim, whereas... Chevy just can't figure out the qualifying trim when the cars are trimmed out and everything. But when they're in race trim, Chevy is, they're okay. They're good. You know, they, yeah. they've got the speed and the, the capability when it comes to the race. So when push comes to shove, are you really going to push it to try to figure out that, yeah, you want to qualify better, obviously, but if you've got the speed on the, where it really counts on race day, do you, do you really want to push too hard to try to figure that out i mean it is interesting though like when you look at some of the chevys that were in it <coughs> you know the ecr cars you had renus vk and ed carpenter up there in the fast night but then you had connor daly who was up there at the top of the speed charts most of the week until they gave him that extra boost and everybody started trimming out then connor daly's car just they couldn't figure it out they couldn't figure out like how to get it to turn well or anything you know so they're just like you know what it is what it is we got a good we have a we'll have a fast car race day that's all that matters but it's interesting that they couldn't figure out one car on that team and the other two made the fast nine but right you know, it happens uh, same thing with like Penske you know you had Scott McLaughlin up there qualifying fairly decently and then you got Will Power struggling to make the field so right it's it's so fickle, but 
See, yeah, biggest surprise for me, um, you know, like I said, could have been willpower, could have been, um, you know, the fact that you know you have Simona Di Silvestro and a you know woman driver, woman owner uh, qualifying for the first time, which that was really neat. Um, Running with Penske Power. Yes, um, but for yeah, me, they have their partnership with Penske. So, for me, it's going to be uh, TK and Elio in the Fast Nine. I mean, these are these are two drivers that I like grew up with at the five hundred with. I mean, I remember when Tony Kanaan, I think he was teammates with Felipe Giafoni back in the beginning days. Um, I remember Elio's like first, you know, I, I was there when Elio won, you know, those first two races. Um, so these are the guys I grew up with, uh, and and they've kind of, you know, obviously they're not racing full time anymore. Um, so it's kind of cool to see those guys, especially TK, who's my favorite driver. So I still have the Seven Eleven hat somewhere. Um, you know, it's cool to see those guys. Um, you know, have good qualifying efforts. Uh, first time that Elio is in the Fast 9 since 2018. That's when he was full-time. First time for TK since 2017 when he was driving for Chip Ganassi, which I completely forgot about. Um, so, um, you know, I just, for some reason, my brain was like, yeah, he went he from... Ten car. Right. I was like, oh, he went from... You know, I, I it was like know. right after he won the 500 too. So everybody was like, "Oh my gosh, TK in a Ganassi car is just gonna blow the world up." And yeah, then, it did not happen. It, it did not work out too well. No. Um. So yeah, it, it was cool for me uh, to see those two guys have good efforts. Hopefully, they can turn that into uh, good runs in the Indy 500 this weekend. So I'm not too surprised about TK. Ganassi's had really good cars this year, and you know. Just him stepping in there, I'm not too surprised about that. I am surprised about Elio, though, making the fast nine with Meyer Shank. Um, they, you know, Jack Harvey is their their guy, and he's still in the race as well. But to see him not qualify that well, and Elio to come in with equipment that's, you know, not the best, um, especially on ovals. I mean, Jack Harvey's done pretty well, but I'm, I'm surprised about that. Um, is probably That's probably the biggest but I would also say um, not seeing enough, not seeing more Chevys up there. Like, because if you would have thought, if you looked at the speed charts going into like this past week, up until Friday, and there was somebody always up there. I mean, it was days where I think one day Ed Carpenter led the way in Noto. Um, so it was really kind of surprising. Not, I mean, yeah, he still fought by fourth, but I mean, it's it's still kind of surprising. Um, that Chevy just can't figure out the qualifying stuff, which, like I said, not a big deal um, in the end. But Elio is a big surprise, and the lack of the Chevys being up there as well after performing so well in practice throughout the week was a surprise for me. So let's go ahead and get into our predictions for the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500. Um, So first we'll go Rookie of the Year, then we'll go Dark Horse, then we'll give our winner prediction. So Rookie of the Year, honestly, just flip a coin because (laughs) because you only have two rookies. It's Scott McLaughlin and then uh, Pietro Fittipaldi. Uh, is the other rookie? Yeah. Um. So I feel like Pietro Fittipaldi though has been a rookie for like three years in the 500. Right. Yeah. I know it, it is a little odd. Um. But I'm gonna go with Scott McLaughlin. Um. You know, just I'm just gonna go with the Penske Power. Um. He's the only regular I think of those two. Um. So yeah, I'm going with Scott McLaughlin just because I mean there's only two rookies and you'll and I have a bigger reason for picking Scott McLaughlin, uh, which you'll find out later on in these predictions. Yeah, Rookie of the Year, I'm going with Scott McLaughlin as well, just because it's like, who else? I mean, I don't think Pietro Fittipaldi is going to outperform McLaughlin. Just be, I mean, if he does, I'll, I'll, I'll eat it. I'll take it. I'll take, the, I'll take the L on that one, but yeah. Um, so for Dark Horse, I'm going to go with uh, Pato Award. He's been in the top 10 nearly every practice. He did qualify 12th. Got his first IndyCar win at Texas earlier this season. He finished 6th last year at Indy, uh, which got him the Rookie of the Year Award last year. So I think Pato Award, um, when you're thinking about, hey, you know, kind of something something that isn't really on the radar, um, you know, because, I mean, we have our normal picks of, oh, it could be Scott Dixon, it could be, you know, Joseph Newgarden, whoever. Um, I think, you know, Alex Below, uh, I think Pat Award, even though Pat Award has been lumped in when we talked about, you know, hey, new faces that are coming out, you know, out and having really good seasons, Pat Award is one of those drivers, but at the same time, you know, it's, I, I think, 
you know, he's a driver that you would not not necessarily, <clears throat> you know, who can capitalize off having a good Indy 500 last year and uh, with the way he's run this year can uh, parlay that into a win. My dark horse, I'm actually going with Connor Daly as my dark horse. Um, he's starting 19th. Like I said earlier, he's had really good speed throughout the practice weeks. I like always consistently up in the top three, top four. Um, he's, he feels like he's going to have a really good fast car on race day. They are concerned that passing is going to be difficult again, like it was last year. But if there's a driver that knows how to push the car and is learning every year how to get around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway better and better and take chances, it is Connor Daly. Um, so I would not be the least bit surprised to see him up there contending for the win um, as the day goes on on Sunday. So it is finally time for us to predict the winner of the 105th Indianapolis 500. And so for me, I was like, you know what? Because I feel like I've, I've become very repetitive. When, we, when we've talked about predictions, we you know go through everything on the podcast. Uh, I feel like I've been a big advocate of Alex Polo been a big advocate of Joseph Newgarden. Um, and as you know, with my pick of Joseph Newgarden to win the uh, championship, it, I, I like to go off of trends. I like to see a trend and be like, you know what, I'm going to go with, you know, because things happen in trends, you know, you kind of have to go off of some of the wacky numbers. So first of all, when you're picking the Indianapolis 500, you have to look at the top 20. Um, so anybody 21 through 33, just write them off immediately uh, because... A, uh, a no driver has won from outside the top 20 since 1974. So just throw all that out the window. Um, you're, you're throwing Joseph Newgarden out the window. Yes, at yes. It was, hey, you know what? Okay. It, it, it was it was the one thing I had to do to make sure I wasn't going to pick him because I did think about picking him. Um, so and it's funny, too, because originally I was going to make this pick my dark horse, and I was like, you know what, Craig? If you're going to go to this length to look up all this stuff, you better make him your pick to win the Indianapolis 500. He was my Rookie of the Year pick. I'm going with Scott McLaughlin, and here is why. So, for one, he's putting, you know, there is some le legit legitimacy to this. He's putting together a great rookie campaign. He's eighth in points right now. He's got third consecutive, uh, three consecutive top ten finishes, including his first ever podium at Texas. So he is, he's got some momentum going. Um, so, but here's kind of where it gets kind of Tim Kirchin off the reservation type random stats. So, uh, driver, he's in the number three uh, Pennzoil machine for Penske. Drivers running the number three have won 11 times. 10% of Indy 500s have been won by a driver in the number three car, but they have not won since 2009. That was Elio's last win. Uh, that's This is the third longest stretch between the car uh, car three winning uh, in Indy 500 history. You, I mean, first time the uh, number three won was in 1919, then not again until 1948. Then they, uh, then they didn't win it again until 19. 62 so that was kind of the first little stretch and then they got their other like eight or nine wins pretty much every six years every six to ten years like ever since then so the number three car is due for a, another win in the Indianapolis 500 also the last driver to win from P17 that's where Scott McLaughlin starts was Eddie Cheever in 1998 98 is the number of the last rookie to win the Indy 500, Alexander Rossi. That's a stretch. Hey, That's a stretch. hey, hey, you know what? What it, a stretch. Not, not as big of a stretch as the next one because the last time a Scott from New Zealand won the Indy 500, a Scott from New Zealand, New Zealand led the field to the green flag. Scott, That's the same Scott. I know, but still. <laughs> but still. <laughs> That's an even bigger stretch. Exactly. I told you. Those last you had me up until these last two. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then the, you just went off completely off the reservation. So, on the last. so hey, you know what? You can you can congratulate me. We're doing the podcast next week. We're talking about Scott McLaughlin, your 2021 105th running of the Indianapolis 500 winner. So look, I don't I haven't gone down this rabbit hole or anything like this for my pick. I'm looking at what the, the speed charts are telling <laughs> me and using my you know logic. <laughs> um, obviously, you know you got to look at like Scott Dixon. I'm not I'm not going with Scott Dixon. But you got to look at you got to take a look at him as a real consideration, obviously. 
The driver I am going with, though, is Tony Kanaan, uh, running with the same team, Chip Ganassi Racing. And um, I feel like this is, this is going to be Kanaan's swan song. This is his, you know, way for him to ride off in the distance, ride off to in the sunset. His John Elway moment right here. You know, he's going to get his second Indy 500 win and be able to hang it up. Um, same thing could be said, though, with Elio if he ends up winning uh those two are those two drivers are some to look out for but i ultimately i believe the 105th indianapolis 500 winner will be tony Kanon. hey i will be very happy if that happens i uh as a big tony Kanon fan i was there in 2013 when he won um you know i was there through all the other times when he you know, almost won but came up short so i, I will Here, be very happy with that. You. you're getting all into like the amount of times a certain number is won has the 48 car uh, won the Indianapolis You know Island. what? Let's look that up because I, I can honestly... tell you the 40 uh, the 48 car yeah in general from all races have have won, have won quite a bit from all series that I've raced there. Yeah. I, well yeah cuz of uh, Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson. Yes. Indeed. And it is Jimmy Johnson's car from Ganassi that Canon stepping into. Very true. Um, looking it up now, because yeah, I went all deep into the rabbit hole uh, yesterday. Yeah. So let's. <laughs> hey, he I was exactly where to go for this too. Yeah, because of that rabbit hole. Exactly, and that's hey, that's what it's all about. All right, let's see here. Getting down to the numbers. Uh, that's position. He's he starts what ninth, eighth, uh, okay. seventh, TK, or no, he's in the second row. Um, yeah. I think it's what. I mean, hey, 2017, no, he's not fourth, though. He's, like, sixth. 2011 was the last time somebody won from sixth. Uh, winning car numbers. Um, that's chronological, but by number, the 48 uh, has won once. That's 1975, and that was uh, Bobby Unser. So not okay. since Bobby Unser in, in the 59th Indianapolis 500. Um, that's how long you have to go back to for the 48 Hold car. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so yeah, that was, are you looking to see if he was like retired, but coming back for one race, just like Tony Kanonis. And you know what, what's really <clears throat> interesting, that would be a huge homage <clears throat> paid to Bobby Unser who passed away this month. True. Hey, I, I like where your head's at with that. That's kind of along the, that's like kind of, that that's, that's crash log logic right there. Like, <laughs> hey, we're going down that. We're going down the rabbit hole. We're going. Hey, yeah, I, I, I do like it. That's not too deep of one, but no. Yeah, there you go. All right, so you got all even more of a reason. You've got TK. I've got Scott McLaughlin, um, and we both have the Nets. A lot of predictions on this week's edition of the Crash Course Bo Podcast. Thank you guys all uh, for hanging out. Dusty in the chat. Um, everybody who uh, watched on Twitch, who's watching on YouTube, who listens on uh, all our different uh, podcast sites, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Uh, thank you guys all for listening. We will be back again next week. Uh, but before we get to that point, B. Scott, where can they find you? Find me on Twitter at Brandon underscore Scott 87. Remember, guys, you can follow us at Crash Course FM on Twitter. You can like us on Facebook, Crash Course Podcast. Go to our YouTube channel, 3C Media. That's where you can not only find the video version of this podcast, but also the MCT podcast that comes out every weekend with Chris, Tade, and Michael. You guys don't want to miss that to get into a lot of fun debates and arguments. Um, and then also remember, you can watch us live every week on Twitch, twitch.tv slash 3C Media. And remember, you can listen to us every week on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever podcasts can be heard. You can hear the Crash Course Podcast. Next week, we will be back wrapping up the Indy 500. We'll see uh, you know which one of our picks uh, pans out. It's going to be Scott McLaughlin, so you might as well just go ahead and mark it down now. B. Scott, you're into betting. Go ahead and bet the entire house. Uh, on Scott McLaughlin. I think it's the way to go. Uh, but regardless, we'll be back next week talking about the 105th running. It's going to be a lot of fun. But until then, have a good week, everybody.